Well, hello, Rev students. Uh, My name is Jeremy Whitehead. Uh, A lot of you guys don't know me. Uh, Some of you do. Raise your hand if you you know me. Okay, a few of you. Raise your hand if I'm your friend. That should be everyone in the room. I'm all of your guys' friend, and I'm excited to be here. Uh, I am our... Uh, Rev student Jasper Canton student minister. Our, so Dave is our Canton student minister. I am our Jasper student minister. You might not even know that 30 minutes up the road, uh, we do Rev students just like this every Wednesday night with a whole nother group of people. It's a pretty cool thing and I get the honor and the privilege of leading that just like Dave does here. But uh, every once in a while, we get the cool opportunity uh, just to be in a different place and, and, and speak to Uh, a different campus, and so uh, I'm excited to be here with you guys. I'm excited for where God is going to take us today, and uh, hopefully you are as well. I always try to start out to let you guys know a little bit about me, and I I think the, the thing I could tell you the most about me that would help you gauge a little bit of who I am is that I love food. Do we have any food lovers in here? Okay, good. Hopefully, do we have any food haters? Some people, all right, how are you even alive? What do you do? How, what, where, where does your sustenance come from? Um, well, I, I love food. I remember when I was uh, dating my wife, we've been married for 11 years, so uh, a little bit. Some of you guys, the, basically the length of some of your guys' life. Um, but uh, we, we've been married for 11 years, and when we were dating, uh, I remember going to my first family get-together with her, right? And so we were going to, to Thanksgiving with my girlfriend's family. And so it was kind of a big deal, right? You know, I, I'm, I'm dappering up. I have a sweater vest. I am looking the part. I, I am doing my part to, to, to present myself well. And, and we get there and, and we get to my favorite part, which is the food, right? And Caroline's, my, that's my wife's name, her family begins uh, going around and saying, hey, this is explaining all the dishes. This is uh, the stuffing and the dressing and the gravy and, uh, you know, aunt blah, blah, blah made this and, and this is the turkey and, and they made this and this is the dessert and they made this and they're going around. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. We're, we're thanking the people that made it. We're honoring them. This is great. And so I dive in and I load my plate up like I am ready to eat some good food. And I sit down and I begin eating the turkey and a thought occurs to me. I'm not sure if I'm a turkey person. Like, like this, this turkey just isn't doing it for me. I've never actually sat and compl- contemplated this before, but I don't know that I'm a turkey person. Maybe I'm a ham person, right? Maybe I like ham. Ham is a far superior meat. Um, but I, I don't know. Right in that moment, it wasn't doing. It was just a passing thought. It came in. You know what? Turkey's not for me. Move on. Eight other things. Most of the food was great. So we're going to move the timetable up about a month. About a month later, uh, I am now eating uh, dinner with my uh, girlfriend at the time, wife now. You guys understand what I'm saying. Her family and my Caroline's mom is making turkey. And I remember even saying to her, I was like, you know what? I'm I'm not a turkey person. Like, like I'll I'll eat it. I'm sure it's gonna be great, but but it just doesn't do it for me. And I remember sitting down and we're, we're, we're eating. And I remember eating the turkey and thinking, oh my goodness, I love turkey. Turkey is amazing. Turkey is wonderful. Turkey and gravy is great. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, this turkey is awesome. And they're like, okay, Jeremy is really excited about turkey. I was like, no, you guys don't understand. I thought I didn't like turkey. What was wrong with that turkey at Thanksgiving? And everyone begins looking at each other and they're like, oh. You see, you remember that part in Thanksgiving where we go around and we we thank everyone for what they make? Well, there's some people who don't make things as well as other people. And so that's also a cue for you to know what food to maybe portion yourself a little less on. And that was the turkey in that meal. And so I was like, this whole time, I thought I wasn't a turkey person. I just didn't know. And and here's what I learned. I believe uh, that this is true in a lot of areas of our life, that until you experience something that is truly good or truly bad, you won't realize how truly good are truly bad something is. It works both ways. Until I had the bad turkey, I didn't know how good the good turkey was. And when I had the good turkey, I knew exactly how bad 
the bad turkey was. You, you guys tracking with me? You guys get what I'm saying? Is anyone hungry? Okay, well, we got no turkey, just pizza, lots of pizza. Uh, well, he, here's why I say this. I believe that is where we are at in the book of Galatians right now. Uh, we, we've been on this journey, we've been, we've been going through it, and, and Paul started off very theological, and he's teaching, hey, that there's no other gospel besides Jesus, no one can do what Jesus did, and week two, we talked about justification. What did Jesus do? Jesus made us right with God. And then week three, we talked about sanctification, sanctification not just that we're made right with God, uh, but that he continues growing us and making us more like him for the rest of our life. And then uh, last week, we talked about our identity, that we are sons and daughters of God, that he has brought us into his family. And, and it's starting to get more and more and more practical as we go. And, and that's kind of where we land on this week. What I believe Paul has for us on this week is, is he wants to paint a picture of something that is truly good and something that is truly bad so that we can tell the difference. You guys with me? I don't know if you are. If you're taking notes, which I know all of you are, uh, you can join us if you have your Bibles. We're gonna be in uh, Galatians chapter five, verse seven. And, and, and here, before, before I jump into that verse, I, I wanna challenge you guys for a second. Maybe you guys are gonna be like the people Paul is talking about here, right? He, he opens up this verse, he says, you were running well. He says, you have been following Jesus well. You have been doing good. And maybe you would say at a point in your life right now, uh, you know, maybe you would say, hey, I have been running good. I have been following Jesus. Like, I have been doing this for a while. Maybe you've been coming to Rev students for most of your life. Maybe uh, you've been going to church. Maybe, you know, maybe you went to camp and you said, hey, I have been running well. And, and here's what I want. You, you might come into a room like this and think, I've already heard everything that there is to say. I already know everything that there is to know, and I wanna caution you because that's the exact type of person that Paul's talking to right here. These are people who know more about the Bible than you do, who have been in it longer than you have, and yet he is still trying to warn them about something. He says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. And like I said, maybe that's, that resonates with you today. That's where you would say you are. You said, hey, there was a time in my life, man, last year, maybe over the summer, maybe I went to camp and Jesus was awesome and camp was awesome and I came back to students and then the school year started and man, I started hanging out uh, with those people and, and, and maybe I'm not following Jesus like I should right now. Maybe you were doing so great and then you got into a relationship and, and that relationship took the place of Jesus and now all you care about is what's going on in your relationship. Maybe you were, you were running so well but something got into your way and when it got in your way, you started doing things that you didn't do before, things that God has not called you to do. Here, here's something I want you to know. If you're taking notes, write this down. God will never ask you to be disobedient. God will never ask you to be disobedient. And like I said, I don't know where that is for you. Maybe for you, you would say, man, I was running well. I was doing so good. I was following Jesus. But then I got into that relationship and the things that are going on in my relationship are not the things that God has called me to do. And God has never asked you to be disobedient. Maybe you started hanging out with a new group of people and the things that you and that group of people do and the things that you and that group of people talk about and the, the way that you and that group of people treat other people are not the ways that God has called you to do and he has never called you to be disobedient. And I, I, it could be a ton of things. Maybe you joined a sports team and the things going on in that team have pulled you away it could be what occupies your time. Maybe you developed a new, new hobby and that hobby takes up all your time and has started to pull you away and Paul is asking this question, what is hindering you? What is pulling you away? You were doing so well, what happened? And here's the danger. And like I said, a lot of you may be following that category. You said, hey, I've been doing this for a while. I would say I'm doing pretty good. Here is the danger 
of what Paul's saying is that it starts with something small. It starts with something small and it can begin to creep in. One mistake becomes another mistake and another mistake and another mistake. One bad decision becomes another bad decision and another bad decision and another bad decision. Something small can grow into something big. The way Paul is going to phrase it right here in verse nine, he says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What Paul, all, unless you guys are like big fans of the Great British Breaking Show, that probably doesn't make a lot of sense to you. Uh, yes, some, okay, some, some fans. Uh, uh, and so leaven is part of the thing that makes bread rise. So if you've ever had like big fluffy bread, leaven. If you've ever had like flat bread, not leaven, right? Maybe some like pita, something like that. So think bread with leaven, big, puffy, growing, Bread without, flat. And so here's what he's saying. He says, once you put a little bit in there, it takes off. It doesn't take much. All it takes is a little bit, and it is no longer in the no leaven category. And, and for you, one mistake, one act of disobedience. Maybe you're like, hey, it was just one time. It's not that big of a deal. If left uncorrected, without evaluation and checking your heart and going to Jesus, it can grow into something bigger and grow into something bigger and lead you to a place you never thought you would be. Uh, here, partial obedience, students, is still disobedience. Uh, a little disobedience is still disobedience. And unless you do something to course correct, unless you do something to change it, it doesn't just stay there, it always grows. It always gets bigger. And Paul's plea, as he's talking to this church and he sees something here growing, he's saying, hey, there's a problem and it's growing. Paul's plea is for us to be very careful about what we let in. We'll pick up in verse 13. He says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Paul is cautioning something here. He says, watch out. There is danger. The, the greater the danger, the louder the alarm, right? If you are in danger of oversleeping, your alarm clock might get loud. If you are in danger of a tornado, a tornado siren will go around your entire community. The greater the danger, the greater the alarm. And Paul is, is trying to say, you should be alarmed right now. He says, some of you are are biting and devouring each other. Now, I'm not sure about you. When I was growing up, I was a biter. This, this, is a con this needs to be a safe place, a place for confession. I remember uh, in like pre-K, early elementary, there was a Lego incident, and, and the only resolution my small mind could come to was to bite the mess out of someone else, all right? Maybe you had anyone have younger brothers, younger sisters that were biters? Who in here is a biter, right? Some of you guys, you're still just taking chomp. Yeah, all right, well, we could talk after. We're gonna have a separate small group up in the balcony, talk to you guys. We wanna make sure we're getting you the care uh, that you need. Um, here, here's what I want you to think about. When he's talking about biting, when he says devouring, he is metaphorically talking about hurting others. He's like, he's like you are hurting each other. The things that you are saying, the, the words that you are using, the way that you are treating each other, you are hurting one another. And I would guess if you evaluated yourself over the last year, you would say there have been people who have been in my life, man, and I have been hurt. I have been bit by the things that they said, by the things that they did. And then if we were being really honest and we evaluated ourselves as well, we would say, hey, there's some things that I have said and there's some things that I have done 
man, and I have bit someone else. I have hurt someone else. You see, what, when we don't watch out for our own self-seeking students, we risk hurting ourselves and those around us. When we don't watch out for our own self-seeking, what I mean by self-seeking is that it's all about us. That's what he's talking about right here. He, he gives you know, two examples. He says, love your neighbor, or he says, bite and devour. He, he, he's posing two ways of life right here, two things. And so he's asking you to evaluate your actions. Would you say that your actions and the things that you do and the things that you say are about making yourself great? Is it self-focused? Are the things that you do and the things that you say and the way that you act about other people and serving people and loving people well? Like I said, he says, there is danger. You need to watch out. You need to know where you are at. Alarms should be going off. And then he continues in verse 16. He says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. I want you to hear that last part again, students. To keep you from doing the things that you want to do. I don't know, like just reading that there's a more bummer verse in the entire Bible. That verse just said that this thing's whole job is to keep me from doing the things that I want to do. And he's saying it's keeping you from doing the things that you want to do because you don't know what's best for you. You don't. He's saying if you got your way, you would make it all about you. And anyone that stopped it from being all about you is at risk of getting bit. It's you. We, we laugh, it's, it, it's funny, but that's what we true. If we don't get our way, what do we do? So, I told you, some of you guys are biters. I get it, right? We'll do whatever we want to. We want to have our own way. We don't like the idea of not getting what we want. But listen, if you got everything that you want, listen, students, lean in for a second. If you got everything that you wanted, you would not be experiencing God's best for you. If you got everything that you wanted, how many times have you, listen, I want you to guys be real with me right now. How many times have you just prayed for something? God, if, if you would just do this thing for me, and a year later, you would look back as like, I'm really glad that I didn't get what I wanted, right? Maybe you've been there before. Maybe you just, you just had to find, that, that person just had to date you, right? And you're just wishing for it, and then you find out that that person is a complete jerk. And you're like, huh, check please, I don't want any of that, right? If you got what you wanted, you would not experience God's best for you. He's gonna, he's gonna get into more detail. This is what happens when you get what you want and it's left unchecked. If you could take getting what you want to as far as it could go, this is what happens. Verse 18, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, Fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I have warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, the, the common thread on all of these things that he lists is that it's about yourself. He mentions sexual immorality. He says, I just want what makes me feel good. Fits of anger, if someone does something that upsets me, I'm gonna do something to make it right. It says jealousy, I, I want what they have. He says sorcery, maybe you think that's funny. Isn't, I wanna be powerful. 
It's all about what I want. Division, what I want is more important than all the people around me. It's about what I want. And if we just got what we want, we would not experience God's best for us. And listen, it's, it's so easy, students, for us to say, well, all, I would never do any of those things, right? I, I, would, I would never do any of that, but it starts with something small. And then it gets bigger, and it gets bigger, and it grows, and it grows. Jesus, Jesus says it like this in Mark chapter seven. It says, he went on. It's what comes out of a person that pollutes. Obscenity, lusts, thefts, murders, adulteries, greed, depravity, deceptive dealings, carousing, mean looks, slander, arrogance, foolishness. Does anyone remember reading a list very similar to this very recently? It says, all of these are vomit from the heart. There is the source of your pollution. Students, it's so easy when we find ourselves doing things that we never thought we'd be doing that are against what God's called us to do for us to blame our circumstances. Hey, the only reason I'm doing this is because of what's going on around me, is because of my environment, but what Jesus is saying right here is that it is because of what is in your heart. He says, your heart has been polluted. So my question for you students is how's your heart? Because the, the, the things that you do are a reflection of where your heart is, how you spend your time, your energy, what you value, what is important to you, that will show you where your heart is. So how, how's your heart? Paul said it earlier, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. If I was gonna take what Jesus said, he would say a little pollution leads to a lot of trash. And students, Paul's warning for you right here is if you live your life just doing what you want, you will get trash. And that is not what God wants for you. So here, here's where we're at in the message. We just got the bad turkey. Thanksgiving's over, but we are about to get the good turkey, students. Listen to this, Galatians 5, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, Jesus have crucified with its passions and desires. I want you to hear that part. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Students, we read two lists right here. And if we're being honest, we have the one over here that we said is the bad turkey, right? Jealousy, slander, murder, sexual immorality, that's the bad turkey. And then we have the good turkey over here. It says joy, peace, patience. Which to you sounds like the good life? The, the good turkey, you guys are so smart, right? We're, we're, it's not even a competition. It's not even close. We know what the good life is. And some of you guys have experienced the bad for a really long time, and I am pleading with you right now, there is good turkey available for you. The good life that Jesus wants for you is available for you. But it says when we follow Jesus, Jesus went to the cross and died so that we don't have to have a bad life, we don't even have to have a mediocre life. We get the best life. And he says, when we crucify our own desires, when we crucify our own passions, when we say, what God wants for me is more important than what I want, that is when you begin experiencing the good life. And he, he lists these things and he calls them fruit, right? Like joy, like you're like, no, a fruit is an apple. Like a fruit is a watermelon. A fruit, like may, maybe a tomato, maybe it's a vegetable. We're, we're still confused about it. I don't know. There's a lot of controversy. Read an internet website. 
And so we're like, how, how is this fruit? What, what does that mean? And, and the interesting thing, I think, is Paul doesn't go into this super long tirade breaking down every single fruit and how it works, but he says, this is the fruit of walking with Jesus. This is what is produced in your life. We talked earlier, we said, how you spend your time reveals where you, your heart is. He says, this is what comes out of your heart when you spend time with Jesus. If you're taking notes, this is how I would say it. The fruit of the Spirit is what grows in us by following Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is what God begins to grow in us when we start following Jesus. And, and what we realize when we try what is good we realize how bad everything else is. Listen, love and joy are far better to experience than jealousy and division. I think everyone would agree here that kindness is superior than fits of anger. We're not talking about the same thing here. Jesus says the good life is available to you. So how do we get it? Paul finishes this in verse 25. He says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He says this phrase, keep in step, to walk alongside. He says, hey, if you want the fruit, if you want the life that Jesus has, it starts by walking the way that Jesus walked. Just some of you probably don't know that uh, I have a six month old as of a couple of days ago. His name is Whitaker. Um, yeah, I know, right? What you can't, that's just, it's just undeniably cute, right? Um, here, here's the thing about Wit, and this is true about all of us, right? We are people who imitate what we see. We imitate what we're around. It's, it's wired into us. So as I spend time with wit, I do things like this, like make faces, like ah, and I jump back. I go ah, and I, I'm just waiting for him to smile. That's what I do, right? That's my life for the next six you know, years or so. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm figuring this out as I go. Never done this before. But, but here's what I've learned. I want you guys to lean in. As I'm hanging out with wit, and I'm wanting him to do the things that I'm doing, for him to learn it, I have to keep doing it again and again and again. And so, like, there's a noise that we make together. I'm, we're all gonna do it together. We're gonna go, <laughs> Some of you guys can't. Right? So some of you guys can't. It's okay. Here's what I want you to know. Wit couldn't do it at first either. Wit couldn't do it at first either. And so I would sit there with him and i go, and he go, ah. And I sit there and go, and he go, ah, right? But after spending time together, doing the things that I was doing, now when I go, he does it right back to me. And, and this is why that's important. When we spend times doing the things that Jesus is doing and we spend time with him doing it, we learn to do the things that Jesus does. So when Jesus says, this is what patience look like, we're like, I can do that too, I've been spending time with you. When Jesus says, hey, this is what peace looks like, we can say, I've been with you, Jesus, I can do that too. He says, this is what kindness looks like. We're like, we might be throwing some, on that. We're like, I need some more time, Jesus. I'm getting there. I'm working on it, right? But the more time we spend with him, we begin to look more like him. Paul gives us some closing words. He says, let us not be conceited. It goes back to that same thing. He says, if you want to be like Jesus, it can't be about you. He says, when it's about you, you begin to provoke one another. You begin to envy what each other has. He says, it can't be about you. So how, how do we spend time with Jesus? We go where Jesus is. We, we open up 
our word and we see what Jesus does and we begin doing the same thing and, and we pray and we ask God to help us do those things and, and God has given us his Holy Spirit and it allows to help us do those things so that when we find ourselves needing to look and live like Jesus, we respond in ways that Jesus would because we've been spending time with him. But I, I, I want to reiterate Paul's warning, students, because here's the thing. We can sit through this whole message and not watch out for the little things that we're letting in. We can not watch out for the little things that begin to creep in, the little pollutions of our lives that lead us to places that we never want to be. And we don't get the good life. Pollution leads to trash. But when we live Jesus's way, we get the good life and we get the abundant life and we get God. 